Welcome. Happy Tuesday, December 13th, and welcome to one of the workshops on our 15th annual VCAN um, conference virtual webinar series um, into a conversation today about Act 172, an act relating to municipal energy efficiency. Um, I'm Johanna Miller. I'm the Energy and Climate Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. I'm really glad to have you all here today, and I'm very um, appreciative of having our uh, esteemed panelists um, join us for this conversation as well. Um, so we are going to be recording. Um, I would encourage you all um, to um, just stay muted. I think we're all, we've exercised our muscles um, well over the past few years, um, but stay muted while you can um, and feel free to put your view into presenter mode when I turn it over um, to our series of panelists. And thank you, Beth, for being a great example of, if you are interested and able just to put your name and um, town or town energy committee in the chat, that would be really great. Um, and we are gonna dig into a really um, exciting conversation and more so um, details about a really exciting and important program. So, I mean, I think you all here are here because you know um, that Vermont's municipalities open, own and operate over 2000 municipal buildings and uh, heating those buildings um, is our state's second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And, but now thanks to the leadership of Representative Laura Sibelia, who we're gonna hear from shortly, the legislature and important work underway at Buildings and General Services, we have a new and needed framework um, to help communities tackle this with some resources and funding support. So we're gonna dig into Act 172 and what that means. Um, and we're gonna start in just a moment with Representative Laura Sibelia, who's an independent representative from Dover, Vermont, representing the Wyndham 2 district. Um, Representative Sibelia was and is a fierce advocate and championing a champion for standing up this new program. As the vice chair of the House Energy Technology Committee, Representative Sibelia helped shepherd Act 172 over the line. And now we have this really important new program. So Representative is gonna start first in a moment, outlining why and she, why she and her fellow lawmakers um, thought this was a worthy and needed program. And I think many of us would agree that is needed and we're grateful for that leadership. Um, so the representative is gonna talk about what it is, highlight some of the work to date to implement it and you know why it matters. So then we're gonna hear from um, the commissioner of buildings and general services at the state of Vermont, Commissioner Jennifer Fitch. Um, the buildings and general services is the lead state agency administering and shepherding this program in its implementation phase. Commissioner Fitch is going to outline the work that has been a lot of work underway and will be underway to stand up the program. And she's going to give you far more details um, on the process and the opportunities to avail yourself of public engagement and outreach support through one grant program, technical assistance support um, through the Regional Planning Commissions, and excitingly, um, the opportunity to access up to the $500,000 in grant support for fuel switching, efficiency, municipal resilience investments. And then last but not least, we're gonna hear from Bennington County Regional Commissioner, Regional Commission, now former Executive Director, Jim Sullivan, who is pinch hitting for Two Rivers Autoquichi um, Executive Director, Peter Gregory, who was going to join us, but has fallen under the weather. And just a note to all of us to stay healthy. Um, and just do what we can um, as we transition back to being together, which is so important. But um, thank you, Jim Sullivan, who's done such important work in Bennington County for so many years for joining us today and for all you've done um, for Vermont and Vermont communities, especially in the Bennington County um, region. So, so that's the flow. We're gonna start with our expert panel and then I'm gonna facilitate um, some Q&A. We hope to have ample time for Q&A. So as we get in, please drop any questions that you have in the chat as they arise, and we're gonna to aim to get to as many of them as possible. And we're gonna wrap our day with you um, at 1.30, and then we're gonna follow up with the presentations um, that you have will be watching today and some resources um, about the grant programs and other opportunities um, to help your communities 
avail themselves of this really exciting opportunity. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Representative Laura Sibelia um, to talk about what this program is, why it matters so much, and um, you know, the opportunity to we can collectively work to maximize as we stand up this exciting program. So Representative Sibelia, encouraging people to turn on presenter mode in the upper right-hand corner of the Zoom box um, into speaker mode um, and drop any questions you have in the chat um, for Representative Sibelia and others as we dig in. Thanks. Joey, shall I share my screen? If, if that's easy or yes. we can. Okay. Um, but yes, you should be able to share your screen. Let's see if I'm doing it here. You are doing it and it looks great. There okay. You there you go. Great. Thank you. Um, here we go. Awesome. How's that? Fabulous. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joey. Um, I really appreciate being here. Thank you all for your work. Um, uh, as Joey said, I have been serving on the Energy and Technology Committee, and we have spent an awful lot of time um, thinking about uh, and devising solutions to the lack of capacity, um, uh, dollars, and uh, and technical technical need uh, that our communities and our state needs to modernize um, our infrastructure. Uh, so we spent a lot of time working on um, on broadband. Um, we also passed the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, which for those that don't know, put into statute uh, a requirement on our emissions reductions. Uh, we did that in 2020. Uh, and coming into, uh, in 2021, uh, we passed uh, additional legislation for our, our broadband, uh, our CUDs, Act 71. And in 2022, when we were coming in, um, uh, one of the bills that Representative um, Tim Briglin and I were talking about uh, wa was how to address capacity on uh, the municipal level for emissions reductions and thinking about a number of different problems. Uh, so uh, amongst those problems, of course, uh, are rising energy costs uh, and that uh, our our uh, heating fuel is uh, regulated by the market, and that's a global market, not one uh, that we control um, either in the state or in our country. Uh, the climate is changing. Uh, I have a background, uh, as probably many of you do here, um, from Tropical Storm Irene, seeing the kind of devastation that can be wrought on our communities from uh, stronger storms and changing climate. Uh, and I've seen us get very close uh, to that level um, a couple of times since. Uh, we certainly know that the world is shrinking uh, and it is digitizing. Uh, Short-term capacity does not exist at, state, at the state level, uh, though some capacity we know exists on the ground. Uh, when I'm not in the legislature, I work um, in economic community development and specifically looking at how to work regionally uh, or, or um, with greater collaboration in order to have more effect, uh, in order to do more. Uh, and uh, that is something when we're thinking about climate, ad climate change adaptation, uh, reducing fossil fuel usage. Um, you know, we see, uh, I represent a bunch of little towns. Um, most of my towns um, don't have an energy planner. A number of them don't have an energy committee. Um, some of them don't have a full-time administrator. Um, you know, and and uh, we know that uh, there are there are a lot of communities that are even smaller. So we know uh, that what we need to do is help uh, all of our communities uh, be able to adapt, be able to address rising energy costs, and be able to keep their people safer. Uh, so coming into the session, uh, actually, we were working on a proposal for fuel switching, and the governor also came in uh, with a pretty significant proposal uh, for climate change adaptation, uh, resiliency within communities. The governor's proposal um, would have uh, invested significantly more dollars 
in significantly fewer communities. Uh, the legislature's original proposal would have invested significantly less dollars in significantly more communities. And so we've really arrived at um, sort of, uh, uh, we arrived at a midpoint, which is lovely when we can see that happen. Uh, in addition, we wanted to focus our efforts. Uh, we have had, and I expect we'll hear this today, um, I know this will be an ongoing challenge, um, questions about, you know, can this apply to school buildings? And uh, we said, no, there's a, there's a lot of focus on school buildings. Uh, there's a lot of need in school buildings, we know, uh, but the, the number 2000 uh, that we got from VLCT, their big long spreadsheet of all of the municipal buildings felt um, pretty daunting and uh, pretty personal for each, uh, each community, hits every community, every Vermonter. Uh, and is also a way if we can help increase resiliency and reduce fossil fuel usage, we can help every Vermonter um, be safer, be more comfortable, and hopefully um, uh, reduce their costs. Perhaps, um, you know, we know energy costs are a big part of our municipal budgets, uh, et cetera. Let's see if I can shift, I can. <clears throat> so as we were looking to solve those problems, we were looking at um, both opportunities, obligations uh, and some examples that we had. As I said, uh, our committee has uh, done a lot of work on broadband and climate, uh, climate adaptation. Um, and so we we're looking at uh, the CUDs, the Communications Union Districts, uh, for those that are not familiar with those, uh, with those <coughs> um, entities. Uh, the first CUD actually was created without uh, legislative help uh, with the um, with the will and drive of folks in the Upper Valley, uh, and that was EC Fiber. And as we in the legislature started to see that our um, telephone lines were becoming less and less reliable, and uh, we were leaving more and more people behind in terms of broadband, uh, there was really a public safety uh, issue that was emerging. A very expensive public safety issue. How do we connect, all, make sure all Vermonters have the ability to call for help, that they're connected to broadband? Um, and a question of who's going to do that work because the state did not have the capacity or the funds to do that. So we set about with two different acts uh, to encourage communities to organize themselves and to follow the model that EC Fiber had brought forward. Uh, and that model was town by town by town coming together uh, and uh, putting in place, uh, putting together a plan and then seeking funding for that plan. Uh, so we did a lot of work in the Energy and Technology Committee on that. It was fresh on our minds. Uh, and it certainly is a place, a, a well that I am not afraid to go back to over and over again. Um, Vermont, as uh, you all know, does not have county government. Uh, if you are a lifelong Vermonter, you might not realize what a big, um, what a big, uh, void that can be. <clears throat> uh, I'm not actually seeking to put in place county government, but that um, that level of capacity is missing in Vermont. So we have nothing really in between uh, the state and our municipalities, save uh, our regional planning commissions, uh, regional development corporations where they where they exist, which is where I work. So uh, we have this uh, example of CUDs of towns coming together to work. Uh, of creating capacity on the ground, finding capacity on the ground. Uh, what's been amazing with the with the CUDs is uh, the, the we've had uh, superintendents, former legislators, former IT professionals, um, students, um, you know, any number of people who have come together to work on and resolve this broadband problem. Uh, when we said, here are funds, you have some decision making um, authority, you have some funding. Um, tell us the best way to get this done in your region. So that's uh, an opportunity. Uh, we put in place obligations. So uh, with the Global Warming Solutions Act, as I said, we put our emissions reductions requirements in statute. Um, in doing that, uh, that's, that has consequences. And uh, to, to my way of thinking, we need to give our communities tools to, um, to deal with that. Uh, and so that uh, has kind of weighed on our, on our minds. Uh, and with COVID recovery, uh, we have seen uh, an inordinate amount of funding um, come into our state for recovery. 
Um, I worry about how we use those funds. I think it's imperative that we use those funds uh, in ways that um, increase the vitality of our communities uh, and resilience of our communities um, and in, on, on investments that will um, provide our children a better chance to um, <clears throat> To pay off those, um, to pay off those investments. So, having said all of that, uh, what we came up with in Act 172, our goal was really to increase, at at the at the town level, increase community wide conversations about adaptation and resilience. For those of you who have energy committees uh, in in your towns, and some of my towns do, thank you for all the time that you have spent on that. Um, I imagine that's most of the folks that we have here today. Not all communities have those, uh, and they are at a pretty significant disadvantage, I would say. Uh, we also wanted to create a long-term network for adaptation and sustainability, uh, going back to this challenge of uh, no, uh, read, no uh, county level uh, capacity. So how could we best support communities on the ground? Uh, we know our, our RPCs, our regional planning commissions, uh, interact with every community in their catchment area. Uh, so that seems like a good um, uh, partner there. Uh, and then at the state level, BGS had uh, an existing program for state buildings looking at uh, reducing fossil fuel usage. And so it was our hope that by connecting BGS to our RPCs, uh, that we would prov that we would create a, a network uh, that could be leverageable going forward uh, for communities our RPCs and state government in terms of uh, additional adaptation and resiliency projects, perhaps even after this. Uh, we wanted and want to reduce fossil fuel consumption uh, through uh, weatherization, through fuel switching, through um, increased renewable energy. And most importantly, we wanna increase sustainability and safety for Vermonters and their communities. And so uh, Act 172 is intended to do that uh, through some small community, uh, small community grants, uh, which should have a tremendous amount of flexibility to them to have these community conversations with some grants to our regional planning commissions for them to provide that um, connection between and support to our municipalities and, uh, and translation services to BGS about uh, folks on the ground, and uh, up to $500,000 in grants per town. Uh, we don't have enough for every town to have 500000 uh, but those will be coming through BGS. And so, Joey, I think I'm going to pause there. Hopefully, I haven't gone over time um, and pass it on. That's great. Stop Representative Sibelia. Um, <clears throat> sure. um, yes, there we go. Thank you so much to Representative Sibelia for that overview and more so for all you did to work with your colleagues, the administration and so many others to lift this over the line. It's really exciting. You outlined why it matters so much. And I think, I think many of us here are very interested in helping this program succeed. And many of us are very interested in the details. And so it's my um, you know, privilege to turn the conversation over to Commissioner uh, Jennifer Fitch. Jennifer Fitch is the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services, um, who Representative Sibelia noted, um, is the lead state agency in the implementation body. So a partner, I hope, to all of us in the progress that we want to make through this new program. Representative Fitch, you're going to outline some of the details of the program. And um, I think I'm just going to invite people again. I think Will Dodge modeled it very well. Um, to drop your questions into the chat um, and we will aim to get to those answers um, after we hear, hear from Commissioner Fitch and then Jim Sullivan and all of you. So welcome Commissioner Fitch and thanks so much for joining us. So um, thank you, Joey. And we're so excited to be here today at VCAN. So thank you for the opportunity to present. I think we're with folks that are like-minded and hopefully really excited to help support this program um, in your communities. So you may not know who we are. So um, we are the Vermont Department of Buildings and General Services. We sit within the agency of administration and likely you haven't heard of us before, 
because we are primarily uh, serve internal state government. And so all the state owned and leased buildings are underneath the jurisdiction of the BGS commissioner. Uh, the fleet is underneath the BGS commissioner. All centralized procurement is underneath the BGS commissioner. Um, so we do a lot of things, but our goal really is to serve internal state government. That all being said, um, we have about 360 employees and we have eight offices and divisions within BGS. One of them is dedicated to making state buildings more energy efficient, and that is the energy office. So um, there was a recognition in 2013 that we needed to start focusing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing operational costs while making our buildings more comfortable. And so in 2013, uh, we were authorized 29 BSA 168, which established the state energy management program. We stood that up in 2013 and we've been working on it ever since. And this program is responsible for all energy management measures in state buildings and facilities. And really that's managed right now through two revolving funds. So the goal is we go in and we look at a building and we do an energy assessment and we look at those opportunities to uh, make our buildings more efficient. And then what we do is we look at the life cycle cost. So we're gonna invest a certain amount of money, how long, and then we're gonna get savings from that investment over time. And that determines how long that revolving fund will be. So if we do lighting, for example, that can be anywhere from five to seven years on average. We take out a loan from that revolving fund and then we pay it back over that five to seven year period. The lighting lasts about 20 years or so, except for technology, which keeps coming along. But in general, it lasts about 20 years or so. So throughout the duration of that asset, you're actually saving again on your operational costs over time. Um, so the, the program has done really, really well. We're Commissioner doing... Fitch, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but do you mind, or Brian, can you um, put that in presenter mode? Sure. Um, to... Yep, I have us listed as speaker mode. Uh, it says no, three... no, no. If you just go up to your slideshow and just go slideshow view from the beginning or whatever, because um, right now we're seeing all of your slides. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, Commissioner. That's okay. Um, but such good content that we're all going to want to dig into. Um, sure. and, uh, mm, so close. Mm. Good thing Brian's doing it because I, I'm usually very terrible at these things. Are you still seeing all of our slides? No, we're seeing like, and it, oh, now we're just seeing you. I mean, it's lovely to see you. Uh, How about now? Just see you. Did you share that with us? Because we can also share for you. Oh, okay, you're screen sharing. There we go. Okay. Now we're on your first slide. Okay, and we're going to leave it there for a minute. <laughs> okay, um, take it away. So here we go. So from the tech. So uh, again, we have a statewide energy management program. It's been in existence since 2013. We're going through and we're doing those building investment energy grade audits. We're determining of that which of the um, different projects that we'll do. So examples of projects that we've done is LED lighting with sensor technology, renewable heating and cooling systems, optimizing building automation automation systems, and we've done a battery backup system at the state house. It's the first state house in the nation with a battery backup system, which is really exciting and really cool. Um, but really what we're trying to do is maximize resilience on renewable energy generation to the best of our ability. So we have lots of solar panels all over the state of Vermont, and basically we're taking advantage of everything that we can up to net metering. So in some cases, we're actually making even more than what we can um, access based on that. Uh, we're also working on flexible load management strategies. So we have three buildings in our portfolio where essentially what happens is once a month, we're working with GMP and they make a call and it's on a day where we're going to have high energy demand, either because it's really cold outside or it's really hot outside. And essentially what we do is we turn off the systems a little bit earlier in the day during those peak events. And that's how we're saving money, but there's also more energy right on the grid for others. Uh, so that's something that we're doing. We've been doing it for a few years now. It's working really, really well. And then we maintain all of the state agency energy plans for um, the entire state of Vermont. As of January 2022, this is really exciting, we have invested 5.6 million 
uh, in 78 projects across the state. We have avoided $2.9 million in energy costs, which is huge. And we've conserved over a little over 200,000 metric million British thermal units and reduce roughly 17,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide. So super exciting. Um, and as a result of that, one of the things that we started a couple of years ago was to, to expand the statewide energy management program to municipalities. And we partnered with the public service department to do that as well as VLIGHT. And we have a working group, Efficiency Vermont is part of that as well. And the goal really was to take our program and expand it so we could do exactly what we're doing in state buildings, but do them at the municipal level. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have enough of a robust funding source. And so the only amount of money that we were authorized um, through a couple of grants was to hire a couple of employees and to start doing uh, building audits. But this was also during the middle of the pandemic. Uh, we had some turnover uh, and we had a lot of restrictions on the work that we could do in buildings. And so unfortunately, that never really got off the ground. And in walks uh, both the administration, as Laura Sibelia said before, and Representative Sibelia. And they basically infused um, an initiative that we we're getting off the ground with a lot of money, right? That's now going to move that initiative forward much more quickly. So really what the message is, is we've been here for a while. Um, we are experts in this field and we're very excited to bring it to the municipal level. And that of course brings us to Act 172. Can you go to the next slide? So um, as Laura Sibelia said, right, what is the big issue that we're trying to solve? Well, we're trying to solve a couple of issues. One is we're trying to meet the goals of the Climate Action Plan and the Global Warming Solutions Act. And for those folks out there, I'm sure that you know them really, really well. Um, but just as a reminder, uh, by the time we get to January 2030, we need to be no less than 40% below 1990 GHG emissions. And then by the time we get to January 2050, we're supposed to be no less than 80% below 1990 GHG emissions. So that's a big lift. Um, I think that's pretty aggressive. And if we don't actually meet those targets, then and what can happen is, is that uh, private citizens can sue the state of Vermont, um, which obviously isn't great either. So those are challenges. A couple of other interesting facts, you know, when we think about GHG emissions, I often think about uh, transportation because it came from the Agency of Transportation, right? And, and it's, it's big on the scene with um, a lot of our vehicles on the road. So what's interesting about that is that transportation only co comprises about 39.7% of total emissions. This was actually really surprising to me because I assumed it would be around you know, 70, 80%. Buildings, which is a shocker to me, um, comprise 33.9% of total emissions. So if you think about that, buildings have a really big role to play in the Global Warming Solutions Act and hitting that target. So that's one of the challenges we have. And then the other challenge we have really is what Laura Sibelia said, right? We don't necessarily have money or resources at the municipal level to hopefully meet these goals that we're all trying to meet collectively together. And so through the administration and Laura Sibelia, we basically came up with Act 172. And the goal, as Laura said, is really a couple. One is to create greater capacity for municipalities as well as provide a funding source, right? To actually do that work on the ground and make these buildings more energy efficient while also improving comfort and lowering operational costs. All things that are, are, are big wins for all of us. And so um, can you go to the next slide, Brian? So there's two really key components of this bill. There are sort of two funding sources. One funding source is, is what I would call one-time money, which is the $45 million in one-time funding. And then we have this pot of $2.8 million, which we're going to turn into a revolving loan fund. And I'll talk about those here uh, in greater detail. In terms of the 45 million, something to know, uh, there's been a lot of questions out there. Hey, you've had the money since July. Why aren't you further along? I'm gonna answer that question for you. So um, when money was first allocated, we were going to use state fiscal recovery dollars. And it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing that it was there, but the curse with using that is that it has to fall within a certain bucket. And initially, the only thing that it could fall into was health and safety. So this was all gonna revolve around air quality um, inside of our buildings, which would really significantly reduce the intent of the bill and what we could actually do on the ground. Uh, luckily, we were selected for revenue replacement in the last couple of months or so. The nice thing about revenue replacement and something for us all to know is that now it's considered state dollars which means it's very flexible and we can implement the bill as intended for towns and anybody out there um, that represents a municipality, 
it's also considered state money and it can be used as match money. So that's really, really exciting. And at some point people will talk about stacking projects. An example of stacking a project is the Department of Libraries also has money that they have been awarded to make libraries more accessible. So you're talking about ADA, you're talking about broadband, you're talking about different components, but you could, if that library was owned by a covered municipality, also match that with some of the funding from Act 172. So now you have even more funding for a library, for example. That's just one example of stacking that I mean. Um, the second pot of funding, which is the $2.8 million in revolving funds, will be slightly more complicated because that, that loan program will be very similar to our state loan program, which means that there will be some level of an investment level grade audit that goes on in these buildings because we do have to determine that payback period so that as communities borrow the money, right, and we loan that money out, over time they're paying that money back through the savings that they're receiving through their operational reduction in their operational costs. Brian, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So what does that mean? What is an eligible covered municipality? It's defined in the bill as cities, towns, fire districts, incorporated villages, and all other governmental incorporated units, except for school districts. And Laura Sibelia talked a little bit about that. And as one essential component in the bill is that BGS will be granting, and we're very, very close, we're very excited. We will be granting $2.4 million to the regional planning commissions to again, build that capacity on the ground. We recognize that the RPCs, nobody knows their communities better than the RPCs. And so the goal really is to have that local uh, technical resource on the ground to help support municipalities in applying for the grant, identifying the buildings, right, that would be good candidates for the programming or for the project, and then helping them apply for different components of the project. And we'll talk, talk a little bit more about that. But really, the RPCs are going to be the first stop when it comes to support and technical assistance, outreach and education, and project planning and management. Now, this is a question that we've received. I don't believe, um, but the RPC is gonna come in and talk after me, that they're actually gonna have the capacity to oversee the actual projects that are being done in buildings. And so one of the things we're gonna be bringing back to our stakeholder group is, can we roll in the cost of a project manager, for example, someone that can actually oversee the work on the ground when it comes time to actually do the projects. And so we'll be talking about that, but we recognize that that is a hardship for many towns and municipalities. So this bill is really broken up into several components. There is up to $400,000 per covered municipality for municipal resilience educational grants. And we are currently defining exactly what that means with Representative Sibelia and our stakeholder group. But I think it can be leveraged for several different things. Um, part of it is just general outreach and education about what is energy efficiency and what is resilience and what does that mean to our community and what are examples of that. It can also be used to help the planning program part of all of this, which is working with the RPCs again to identify potential candidate buildings to be rolled into this program. So if a town or community doesn't know how to identify them or doesn't really know how to access the funding, this money can be used for that as well. So a lot of different things can go into that bucket for that up to 400,000 or $4,000. The second component are these building energy efficiency and resilience assessments. So what does that mean? So in the bill, it lists several different things when we go through and do an energy efficiency assessment. But essentially, and I know that this happened um, at least where the NBDA region is, it's going to be a walkthrough building assessment. And you're going to be walking through with an expert that's going to be looking at things like, um, it's going to be looking at insulation. It's going to be looking at your current heating system. It's gonna be looking at the condition of your windows. It's gonna be looking at all of those elements, right? That, that if you have a leaky building, for example, your building cannot be efficient. So it will be identifying things like that. It will also be looking for candidates, for example, for battery backup systems. That's where the resiliency component comes through. It will also be looking for opportunities to do what BGS has done and you know, potentially tapping into a solar panel either on the site or elsewhere, still a detail we need to, to work out but it's gonna be looking at a lot of different things. It will be looking at potential candidates for setting of EV charging stations so we can support that transportation component as well. So a lot of different things are gonna be part of that building energy efficiency assessment, but essentially it's gonna be a walkthrough with someone that is going to be under contract with BGS 
we will coordinate that all through the RPC to coordinate with the covered municipalities because we have to get a lot of work done in a short time frame. So we all have to be as efficient with the use of our time as possible. So what I envision is we will hire people, they will be under contract. RPCs will be working with their covered municipalities and they will set up those assessments so that they're sort of grouped by geography. And so we can do multiple assessments in a day. And then the, the product of that will be identifying opportunities to make buildings more energy efficient and resilient. And there will be a cost component associated with each one of those. Then the third component, which is the last component you see there, are those energy resiliency projects. So as Laura Sibelius said, up to $500,000 for covered municipalities to make buildings more energy efficient and resilient. And there are um, some specifics in the bill that talks exactly about what that money can be used for, but we're still kind of ironing all of those things out. But certainly for things like weatherization, fuel switching, biomass, those kinds of things uh, will definitely be eligible underneath this program. So what I envision as the next step is once all of those energy resiliency assessments come in, the RPCs will work with their covered municipalities to go through the results of those audits and identify those items that the municipality would like to move forward with. And then the next step is basically working with a contractor to say, okay, contractor, here's my scope of work. What do we think it's going to cost our municipality to do this project? They're gonna get some pricing from some local contractors. And then what will happen is the RPC will assist the covered municipality in filling out the grant applications to apply for that up to $500,000 per covered municipality. We will then have a ranking system. So if we go, can we go back up? Cause I sort of um, missed the map, which was pretty important. One more, one more, there we go. So one of the things that representative Sibelia did which I think is great and we're so happy um, that she is referencing this. So in 2019, Efficiency Vermont did an energy burden report and they identified those municipalities that have the highest energy burden and the least amount of resources. And this bill prioritizes those communities for funding of the $500,000. So there's a bunch of other measures that are, are mentioned there like geography and population and different things like that. But the really the nexus or where we're starting again will be a focus on those communities that have the highest energy burden and the lowest amount of resources. We'll go back to where we were. One more. Um, so here's a little bit of information that we can provide right now. Um, the assessments are supposed to be complete by 115-24, all the grants obligated by 12-31-24, and project grants expended by 12-31-26. What the great thing about revenue replacement is, and this is something that I love, I think you've all heard that there's not a lot of, there's a lot of work and not a lot of tradespeople out there to do the work. And so right now it's taking a long time to find contractors that can actually do projects. The great thing about revenue replacement is all we need to do is we need to obligate the funds to municipalities by a certain date, but there is no specific date in which the work needs to be done. We think a two-year time frame is reasonable, but right now that's still a flexible time frame and something that we need to uh, fully vet with our stakeholder group. But the good news is, is that there's a lot more flexibility with revenue replacement than we would have had if it had remained state fiscal recovery dollars. And that's the end of our presentation. Let's take this off here. Thank you, Commissioner Fitch. Um, there are lots of questions. Um, I think you ans answered a couple of them in your slides. We're gonna share those afterward, um, but I hope you all can stick around for some questions because we're gonna aim to get to as many of them as possible. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to um, invite uh, Jim Sullivan, who has been the longtime executive director of the Bennington County Regional Commission, um, to share a little bit about the role of the RPCs, the work that they've been doing with communities, and the work that they are beginning to ramp up to and look forward to doing with communities. So, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you to take it away. And Thanks. Thanks very much, Joey. And um, thanks. Thanks for having me today. I'll be as a last minute substitute. Um, so I apologize for being woefully unprepared and not having a, a PowerPoint presentation or a very well organized presentation. 
But um, I have been involved uh, with municipal and regional energy planning work for uh, quite some time and uh, worked a little bit with Representative Sibelia and some other folks during the development uh, of this of the uh, Act 172 program. So um, I won't be able to talk to you and answer a lot of the specific questions, the very good specific questions I saw popping up in the chat about uh, details of, of uh, program implementation. I got to focus uh, a little bit on um, the Regional Planning Commissions and the work we have done and the work that we hope to do to support this um, program uh, as it goes forward. So many of you know us well. Oh, and by the way, I also see many of my uh, Regional Planning Commission colleagues out there. Um, so uh, when I forget something, feel free to uh, chime in in the chat and uh, and uh, cover cover me on, on those. Um, so that many, most of you know about the Regional Planning Commissions and have probably worked with the Regional Planning Commissions in a number of areas, including energy planning over, over the years. There are 11 regional commissions around the state serving all the municipalities uh, in the state. And as was mentioned, we do have, uh, I think, a very good working relationship with our, the towns and villages in our regions. And we have, uh, you know, without, without having to do a whole lot of um, uh, thinking about it, we have a pretty good knowledge of where all those municipal buildings are and what the opportunities might be and, and who to talk to, perhaps most importantly, who to talk to in, in the towns and villages about, uh, about uh, uh, specific building uh, projects and potential for work. Um, we have at the, the regional commissions and a lot of the work that I've been involved in over the years worked on um, after developing regional, uh, rather detailed regional energy plans, we, we've taken that down to develop so-called enhanced municipal energy plans um, that meet a number of statutory requirements. And is. Part of that process, typically, we gather a lot of information on energy use in municipalities, and that's energy use in the broader community, but also energy use by the municipality itself, energy use in its, um, the buildings that it's owned and the operations it, it carries out, and the vehicles it, it has on the road. So um, we've worked with a lot of our towns and villages on, on developing that kind of information. So we have... You know, pretty good working knowledge, and we hope to expand that uh, moving forward because certainly that's the type of information that's going to be necessary to get uh, to get this project up up and running. Um, over time, I, I do want to say um, that we have had um, my goodness, we've had energy energy funding for regional planning commissions coming from various sources over time from uh, the regional energy plan development as noted to development of municipal energy plans to support from groups like Efficiency Vermont to help us with some implementation measures, um, some a special legislative uh, appropriation a year ago to help us further with energy um, plan implementation work. And now getting really specific with uh, the $2.4 million that will uh, help the regional commissions um, assist municipalities with the Act 172 information. Uh, the, the things that the municipalities can um, look to the regional planning commissions for, uh, I think, and again, I don't have, I, I have, I have questions along with you about exactly what the program is going to look like. I know BGS is, is uh, very, uh, uh, work, working as hard as they can to, to put the details together. Um, so I'm speculating a little bit on just how this is going to look, but um, among the first things that that we'll want to do is, uh, you know, help municipalities identify appropriate buildings, buildings that are eligible and buildings that uh, there's a lot of community interest in making those improvements. Um, you know, what we've done so far at the Regional Com Commission in Bennington County, and I, I suspect some regions have done more and some have done less, but we've, um, you know, we've actually uh, sent out a survey to all the municipalities to try to gather the most current baseline information we have about the municipal buildings. You know, what the what the buildings are, how large the buildings are, where they're located, how old they are, their history of energy use, any recent energy work or energy audits that have been done. 
um, just to kind of compile a whole um, just the background information, just so that we have a good working knowledge going into the the the, the first phase of this thing, which is identifying a, you know priority buildings for these assessments and walkthroughs. So um, you know, again, that's nothing that's necessarily part of this program, but it's it's kind of background work that that we've been doing. Um, to try to get uh, ready and to get municipalities thinking about the program. Um, once once the, the buildings are identified um, by by PGS for the the uh, assessments, uh, you know certainly um, you know we we have every intention of working with the municipalities and coordinating with PGS, uh, you know to to um, help determine. Um, where the assessments are going to happen and in what sequence and whether there's logical uh, groupings of, of buildings that can be done, uh, you know, working with, with the uh, municipal officials in those towns. Um, we're, uh, we're, we also expect uh, once the, uh, the program is, is up and running and those assessments are, have been conducted to, uh, uh, you know, to work with the municipalities to help with project management. Now, um, the commissioner mentioned that project management can be a, a big task and, and, and there, there may be a need to supplement, there probably is a need to supplement the Regional Planning Commission uh, funding with uh, some project funding to help support the local project manager. Um, a lot of the Regional Planning Commissions have done uh, uh, local project management work in other areas over time, um, specifically, I think, in uh, helping municipalities manage uh, implementation of local transportation projects um, through things like the Transportation Enhancement or Transportation Alternatives Program, the Bike Ped Program. And uh, anybody who's done a lot of that knows a couple of things. Now, it, <laughs> one, it's very complicated uh, and expensive to move those projects forward. And without someone who's really has that as a primary responsibility to manage that project um, in support of the municipality, the projects move very, very slowly, if at all. So um, I, I want to emphasize both that that's an extremely important function, and that uh, and that it 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 takes a lot of resources. Um, and I, I, I would note with all of these various projects, um, similar in scope potentially. Um, moving at the same time, it would certainly seem that there are some economies of scale that could be had by working with, uh, you know, Regional Planning Commission to group some of these projects together and to, and to uh, work with, uh, you know, uh, uh, a consultant or group of consultants um, who are doing similar work all in one area. Again, those are, you know, details that will have to be worked out once the, the program um, guidelines are are fully developed and released. Um, I, um, one of the things that I, I would like to mention um, too is that I see as a great opportunity with this program, and, and especially I think working with and through local energy advocates and local energy committees is to use this information um, or these projects that are being developed around municipal buildings, um, weatherization improvements, uh, switching to alternative heating systems, be they uh, uh, heat heat pump systems or uh, advanced wood heating systems, um, integration of uh, uh, you know solar panels or other renewable energy resources, um, some of the resiliency improvements that that were talked about, and and use those as as uh, really a teaching tool for the broader community. Uh, you know a lot of a lot of town office buildings, for example, are not uh, too dissimilar in, in size and, and energy usage than uh, a lot of uh, residential buildings and a lot of small commercial buildings. So there's a tremendous amount of information. And I, I really think, um, you know, educational opportunity associated with these municipal projects. Well, this building, this pro program certainly is all about municipalities and municipal buildings. I, I do think that, uh, you know, we need to do everything we can uh, across all of the sectors <laughs> uh, to, to advance energy efficiency improvements. So um, I, I'm really um, looking forward uh, to having regional commissions um, kind of integrate these um, municipal Act 172 projects into their, their broader 
municipal uh, energy planning and energy plan implementation work. And so um, again, I, I, that's uh, unfortunately all I have to say, and, and I don't have a lot of details uh, at the moment because we're still waiting for a specific uh, program guidelines to come out. But I do, did want to uh, you know, make an appearance uh, on behalf of the regional planning commissions just to let everybody know that the RPCs are are um, staffed up and fully engaged uh, with uh, in thinking about this program and eager to work with all of you on identifying uh, suitable buildings in your communities and in helping serve as a liaison with BGS and the other program partners uh, to, uh, to start getting some really meaningful work done at the local level. So thank you, Joey. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks again to everyone for joining us today. And yes, this is indeed going to be a, a major team effort um, of variety of players and RPCs are critical conduits to their communities and the role of BGS also really exciting and important too. And there are lots of questions and I think some details um, to be finalized indeed, but I'm wondering if the BGS team representative Sibelia and Jim would be willing to try and field some of these questions that we are getting in the chat. And if you don't mind, I'm going to, um, and, um, I'm going to try and get to as many as possible. Um, and also too, I know it's a dynamic duo over there at the BGS offices. So I kind of, I would love to invite Brian Sewell just to introduce himself. Many of you probably have met Brian, um, but to the degree you guys are co-tackling, um, questions, it'd be great to have you introduce yourself. And then we're, let's dig into some of these really important questions and maybe Tyler too would want to introduce himself. So hi, Brian. Sure. Thank you, Joey. Um, Brian Sewell, the State Energy Program Manager under Buildings and General Services. Um, so that's for the SEMP program, State Energy Management, uh, and now this Municipal Energy Resilience Program, which we're really excited to roll out to towns all across Vermont. Um, so I'm happy to be here and answer questions with you all. Yeah, and I'll just say who I am real quick. I'm Tyler. I'm also working closely with Brian and, and Commissioner Fitch on this program and the, the Municipal Energy Resilience Program Coordinator. Um, I see some people on this call from the South Burlington Energy Committee, who I actually did some work with a couple of years ago when I was back at Middlebury College. So um, it's great to see everybody. That's great. Well, I am going to just ask some questions. And to the degree that some of these questions are really easy um, for someone just to give a yes or no answer to, and then I'll defer to you all um, to who is the best to tackle some of these questions. But I'm just starting at the top. First question asked goes to um, Will Dodge. Are new municipal el buildings eligible if they replace an existing fossil fueled municipal building? So is that something, are new municipal buildings eligible? So uh, Laura, Representative Sibelia can jump in here because maybe I'm gonna answer this incorrectly. I believe the intent of the bill though we still have to sort of finalize some things, but I believe the intent of the bill was to make existing municipal buildings more energy efficient and resilient. But Representative Sibelia, jump in if you- No, I would totally agree. I think there is some flexibility with BGS, but remember we also have this other filter of prioritizing uh, heavily energy burdened towns. Uh, so I mean, there's, there's a number of different screens, but. It was not the intent to necessarily build new buildings. Thanks, and I, I, I would I would just jump in because I was interested to the answer to the answer to that question too. Um, we we have a we have kind of a spectrum of town office buildings. For example, in in Bennington County, one that is in the active planning stages, and I know they're looking to make it as energy efficient as possible. And I realize that's not the priority of this program, but kudos to the town of Dorset for that. Um, but we also have a couple of fairly recently constructed municipal office buildings in Bennington County. And I would just point out, that, and they happen to be, I think, in, in fairly energy burden communities. Um, and I would, I would point out that the construction of those buildings might be um, 
relatively good because it's new construction. But I would also note that it's also an opportunity to fairly easily and efficiently implement some fuel switching um, projects in those buildings. That's great. Yeah. And storage. Mm -hmm. Representative awesome. Sibelia, yeah. there, there was a question, and I don't know um, if this is for you or someone else to answer the question along similar lines is, does this mean that most towns in Chittenden County won't be elig eligible regarding the energy burden overlay? So the commissioner will have the final say here, but that was not the intent to disqualify any town. The intent was to prioritize those towns with the least means and the most burden. I concur. Excellent. Moving on, because there's so many good, important questions. Um, there are some questions related to solar. Um, you know, can there are, is there an opportunity to upgrade historic register buildings with um, solar panels? Um, is solar a potential part of this program? So oh, that is still yet to be defined. Solar is definitely mentioned in the bill, and it is one of the things that we will be um, addressing in the assessments. So we will have the information. Um, I am a supporter of solar myself. So I think, and again, I don't want to speak for Representative Sibelia, there are certain components like fuel switching and weatherization, for example, that are specifically mentioned as eligible uh, items for the funding. So we wanna see a variety of those as well. But I think if, if folks are also pitching opportunities for solar as well, then we would be supportive of that too, but still to be defined. Representative Sibelia? Yeah, I would just add, um, this is part of where the smerging happened uh, with right. the governor and the legislature. So the governor had um, envisioned a very wide um, look at communities, um, for a number of different uses. Uh, and so the assessments contain most of the language that the governor had proposed uh, and the grants propose, uh, contain most of the language that the legislature proposed. So having that assessment done, um, even if you're not able to utilize the funding now for it is not, I would argue is not um, a waste of time. Um, and you know the commissioner will, work through determining what is um, going to be eligible. Makes Just to it. follow on um, Representative Sebelia, so we also know that there's a number of funding opportunities out in municipalities. Part of our work with the RPCs is going to be providing that kind of assistance to figure out what funding you have, how does the funding in Act 172 stack in, and making sure that communities get the best bang for their buck. So if, if something had been budgeted for a solar project previously, um, then maybe we would look at, you know, trying to maximize the 500,000 on building envelope, thermal improvements, fuel switching, and layer in as best we can so that we get the most work done for towns. Yeah, and I, th I think uh, the question and the issue really points to the um, wonderful interconnectedness of all of this energy work that we do, because we, we certainly talk about uh, you know, fuel fuel switching and, and electrification across all, all of our sectors, including heating and transportation. And then we also obviously need to deal with where the electricity comes from. So the extent the, that it, it's possible to ready buildings for or, hope, or possibly even integrate, um, you know, electricity generation into a project, I think, you know, helps uh, address the, the whole range of, of of energy issues that municipalities are facing and which are are pretty clearly um, you know pulled out in the municipal energy plans when it comes to the need for for local generation as well as local um, energy efficiency improvements. That's great. I'm trying to well first I'm going to absorb um, one of my favorite new words smurge and I'm trying to smurge Smush and merge, is that, isn't that what it is? Smush and merge? Yeah, trying to smush and merge, smurge a couple of questions together to try and get to as many as possible. So in that vein, is someone at BJS or elsewhere available to discuss funds, um, like the stacking of the fund options that you mentioned, Commissioner Fitch? And then along those same lines, will BGS or someone help communities leverage this money 
with federal dollars that are available through refundable tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act or other things. Um, so kind of like, can you help them think about stacking and who or who can um, help communities access other dollars? So Katie Buckley, who, if you don't know her, she is phenomenal, um, is working for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and she has been hired to help communities with ARPA funds, meaning understanding what's available, what can be leveraged, what can be stacked. It's my understanding in talking with her recently that the LCT is planning on putting out a document and having some resources around stacking opportunities within the ARPA dollar space, and obviously this program as well. So um, I know VLCT is working on providing that information uh, and the administration also recognizes that there is a need for greater assistance and capacity building to help get all these ARPA dollars out the door as well. And I believe they're working on a proposal uh, to get resources basically on the ground to help in this effort. So that isn't specific to BGS and Act 172, um, and we will likely not be the experts, though we'll learn along the way, like everybody else. Uh, but I would say Katie Buckley and VLCT is a great place to go to start. And then hopefully there will be additional resources. And Laura, I know you've also been working a little bit in that space, and you may have even more information than I do about potential resources. Uh, well, not yet. Uh, aspirational and hopeful um, uh, about what the governor may come forward with or what the legislature may come forward with. But in terms of existing resources for municipalities uh, and large infrastructure projects, um, in Southern Vermont, I would say, oh, you should talk with your regional planning commission and uh, or your regional development corporation. Um, I realize those organizations may be slightly different uh, in, in operation throughout the state, but those entities can help put together those uh, and troubleshoot those uh, financing stacks regularly. Uh, we'll be doing in Southern Vermont, we will be doing some webinars about uh, ways to combine. I expect Katie uh, at VLCT will be doing um, some. And so, you know, we're encouraging and working with the commissioner on, you know, pulling all of these resources together to maximize uh, the assistance to all in terms of questions. Joey, um, you know, I'm sure here we are webinar right here, so. Well, so that we don't inundate fabulous people like Katie Buckley to the degree there are those those things that are open and would be available to all. We'd happily promote them. I think there would be interest. Um, I think Katie will be an incredible resource and we'd love to help communities um, access. And, and the commissioner has a website up. Uh, it's not doesn't have a lot on it yet, but that would be a great place for those types of resources also. Absolutely. And the one big message, um, so the administration has been going out and doing capital for a like days around ARPA uh, funding and programs like this. And the big message that we're providing to communities and towns is to really vet all of these, we really have to understand the projects that the communities would like to move forward with. And it's likely going to be a consultation on a project by project basis in terms of, hey, I want to do this stormwater project okay, well then you qualify for X, Y, and Z funding. So if you are out there and I can give the best piece of advice right now, it's really working with those communities to understand what types of infrastructure projects that they have in the hopper or may want to pursue in the future. Great. Um, to the degree, I wanted to make sure it's the right website that you reference, Representative Sibelia, either Brian or Representative, if you can put that website in the chat or we can follow oh, yeah. up. We're gonna follow up with all these resources. That'd be great. Um, there are some questions around, you know, defining, like just clarifying the role of investment grade audits and then defining that. And then there was a question slash concern about the amount of dollars it takes, you know, the amount of work it takes to undertake an investment grade audit. So just clarifying what that is, why it's needed, and, um, you know, sort of addressing that concern if you can. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So for the 45 million and of that 45 million, 36.6 million has been carved out to do both the 400,000 or the $4,000 what we call mini grants for education and outreach and planning. Um, and then the up to $500,000 for projects. 
Um, those are going to require that what I'm going to call a walk around audit, which is we're going to right hire someone that's going to walk around with somebody to identify opportunities to make buildings more efficient and resilient. The investment grade audits will be for to access that $2.8 million revolving fund. My message to everyone right now and has been to my team, I really want to focus on the 45. We, we obviously have the 2.8 available. And if we have some pilot communities that want to be able to access that funding and work with us hand in hand to get those assessments done, we will do that. Um, but right now our focus really is on that 45 million because that's one time money we have to get out the door. And in theory, this 2.8 million is going to be sitting there hopefully forever um, and can be accessed. And our goal actually is to try to increase that amount in that account over time. Um, so right now we're really going to be focused on the walk around assessments and not the energy grade. That said, like I said, if we have a community or two that wants to pilot doing this investment grade audit, that would be great. And we're looking for volunteers, but we do recognize that that's a lot more work and a lot more intensive than the walk around audits. Yeah, and I, I know um, that there's been some interest in in the relative values of walkthroughs versus investment grade audits expressed by some of the local energy committees in, in our region. And I, I have to say that I've been an advocate for um, for the walkthroughs for most of the, these these projects because um, you know remember that these buildings right now they're they're being they're being heated right now by oil or propane <laughs> largely and uh, some of them electric resistance heat even and um, you know so they can they can be heated it's a question of with what and how efficiently and a, a walkthrough by somebody who knows what they're looking at can identify without you know, a huge amount of, uh, of effort, um, you know, really logical, clear, low hanging fruit, things you can do to tighten up the shell of the building um, to, to, you know, while still keeping it, um, you know, environmentally and public health wise safe and sound, the types of those types of shell improvements that are going to allow you a municipality to switch to a, a much more efficient and low or non-carbon heating source like like uh, electric heat pumps or uh, or an advanced wood heating system and once once we get those types of improvements made you know that the basic shell improvements made and the and the, the switching to an alternative fuel source um you know that the the other stuff the the really fine tuning stuff i think can happen over time but this is really a great opportunity to get those big infrastructure pieces done um, now uh, and quickly, and so that's that's why I've been I've been kind of pushing, as the commissioner said, to to get that forty five million dollars uh, spent um, in in that way as soon as and as efficiently as possible. Yeah, I want to thank Jim and and Representative Sibelia for making an effort to um, focus on envelope improvements in addition to fuel switching. Uh, we don't want to be in the habit of installing new equipment in a building that's that's leaky, right? So it is really key that we do these assessments to identify what building shell improvements need to be made so that we can get the best, um, you know, efficient use out of the new systems that we're, we're hoping to install. That's great. Okay, so you're answering some of these things, but I just want to make sure since there are a lot of questions, again, related to the assessments, are all municipalities eligible for the assessments? Can municipalities have any number of buildings assessed? And to the point that you were just making, Jim and others, would it be more efficient to pick one municipal building, you know, or several and see which one, you know, experts would choose? So speaking to like, a, can everyone access the assessments, the number, and then again, speaking a little bit more to the strategy, which you've been alluding to a little bit already. So any, any covered municipality can apply for the assessments and they can apply for any number of municipally owned buildings. And so that's really up to the municipality and hopefully the RPC will be working with their municipalities to help identify those buildings. If it were me, I would look to the buildings that we believe need the most amount of work in the energy efficiency space for the greatest bang for the buck. Um, but that all being said, again, that's up to the covered municipality. There is $5 million that's allocated in Act 172 for the assessments. And so basically we're going to do as many assessments as we possibly can until that $5 million is, is gone. 
So that will be the goal. At this point, we do have an RFP on the street uh, to hire some consultants to be able to do these assessments. Once we get those in, we'll have a better understanding of how many we can actually do within the 5 million, because that's all based on what it will cost, right, to have a walk around assessment completed. So we'll have a much better sense of how many we can do with the 5 million. Once that uh, RFP comes back, responses are due this month. And so I'm hoping by you know early January, we'll have a sense of how many we can do, uh, but they are open to all covered municipalities and for as many municipally owned, except for schools, uh, buildings that are there. I don't know if Representative Sibili, if you wanna add anything to that. I do not. Okay, just wanna make sure. Um, Thank you. I'll plug, uh, Joey, just briefly that if you have um, local vendors that you know can provide um, building walkthrough assessments, we would absolutely encourage that they encourage you that um, you reach out and get them to apply uh, to submit a bid for this RFP. Um, we want to build out as much capacity for these assessments as we can across the state, um, and we'd be happy to support local contractors. So, Joey? I see a really important question that is a common Please. theme everywhere um, that Bob Farnham has asked. I was just going to ask you that. Yep. Yeah. Please. How quickly we can educate a workforce to do a lot of this work. Um, I am not convinced that we can educate a workforce quickly enough to do all of this work. Part of going to ground, part of going to our municipalities is literally trying to find where there might be capacity, who are, you know, maybe there are retired folks in your community who can do some of this work, weatherization work. Um, maybe you, there's a resource, you know, next door that uh, in your neighboring town uh, that can share or regionally that can be procured in terms of doing some of this work. Um, you know, Vermont does not have enough bodies to do the work in any sector. Uh, and uh, training uh, is important, uh, but there's not a lot of bodies to train. And so we've got to find alternative means of generating some capacity. Uh, so that's really the most important aspect for me of getting to ground, getting to municipalities. Our volunteer energy committees, our CUDs, I mean, people are literally modernizing, they're volunteering to modernize Vermont's infrastructure. And while it may sound absurd, we're, we're there's not a lot of other options and we're doing it. So I don't know that that's especially helpful, but that's my answer. No, that, that, um, that's a theme that has, uh, we, we've been grappling with for as long as we've been involved in the energy plan work because we've gotten a sense of how much work needs to be done and the resources that are out there and there's a huge uh, mismatch there. Um, and we we frankly had a very hard time uh, motivating people to to get into the weatherization and energy uh, audit uh, uh, business. But um, you know, hopefully, programs like this are going to provide a little bit more motivation, and people will recognize a business opportunity, especially a lot of existing businesses that are working in energy right now that see the the you know market share associated with supplying fuel oil for example, uh, you know, diminishing over time, this is a great opportunity for them to, you know, to grow their business, um, staying in energy, but in a different direction. And I would note that, um, and, and apologies, but you can contact Callie Fishburn in our office, but there is a, a program coming out, um, I believe serving Rutland and Bennington County to provide training and certification for whether it to, to train weatherization workers coming up this winter and spring. So. Okay, I have a few questions that I think are potentially quick yes or no or easy answer questions. So think of this as like a quick rapid response quiz. Okay, can funds from this program be used for a replacement of a hundred year old tired inefficient building? To replace a building with a new building, I yeah. would say, I would say, unlikely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Unlikely. Unlikely. Okay. What is the timeline for the program guidelines to be finalized? We are rapidly working with our stakeholder group to develop those timelines. The first goal was to 
get the grant agreements established with the RPCs and those grant agreements are like ready to go. So we just need to get them out and get them signed. That's step one. Uh, step two is to get the what we call the $4,000 mini grants or those those educational outreach and planning grants out on the street. And uh, Representative Sebelia has given us a deadline of town meeting day. So we're hopefully going to beat that or or hit that. Um, and then the assessments should be ready to go, I would say, in about three months or so, because we need to execute contracts and do some different things. So I think you're looking again sometime in March, April. Um, we need to give a couple of months for people to apply and get those assessments done. We'll probably give ourselves about six months or so. And so my best estimate, guesstimate, is 12 to 16, 18 months out on the 500,000 on applying, being able to apply for the five up to $500, up to $500,000 grants. Now, again, those are very loose dates. So we will be defining those further with our stakeholder group. Please do go to our website. We will be making sure we're coordinating very closely with the RPCs. They will have all of the information. Announcements will be coming out both through BGS and our distribution list, as well as the RPCs. And we're gonna be moving in lockstep with them. Great. To, to okay. echo the commissioner here, I think if we can, um, again, just reiterate for communities to kind of funnel up through their RPCs, it's going to really help cut down on the timeline um, for getting things processed. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, hold back on starting to contact them now, tell them you've got an idea, um, you know, bring, bring whatever information you can to them now. There's no reason to wait on that piece so that when um, application dates open, we're ready to go. And, and the RPCs are eager to hear from you, I assure you. That is great. Okay, in the vein of trying to hit quick questions, did Commissioner Fitch say that the implementation deadline for projects is flexible between, beyond 12-31-26, which is the expenditure deadline? Right, so we have to grant all the money out by a certain date, but then there is really no specific date in which the work actually physically needs to be done. We're trying to put in some kind of parameter uh, right now, we have a two-year time frame in mind, but it's it's very flexible. So we'll be watching what's happening in the market as we lock down those dates. Okay. Another couple of quick questions. Ideally, when, how will the interest rate be set for the revolving loan fund, and can it be less than the market rate? Those are great questions that I don't know the answer to, Brian. Do yeah, you know? that's a great question. Obviously, we would want to shoot for a rate that's below market. Um, otherwise, you know, what's the benefit for towns going to this program? Um, I believe we have a submission coming up at the beginning of uh, 2023, um, by the end of January, to get our suggestion into Treasury. Um, we have a new Treasurer coming in, so we're excited to work with um, the State Treasurer to get this set up. Excellent. This is one that may be top of mind for several. If an audit had been done by a certified contractor years ago, is it valid for this? So the answer is, it depends. It depends how long ago it was done. It depends if any work has been done on the building ever since. And it also depends what the scope of that audit was. Because if it doesn't pull in all the elements in Act 172, then we'll do something called an audit light, which is where we'll take the audit that's been done and then we'll still do the walkthrough, but only focus on those things that were not done under the prior audit. So it all just depends. Okay. Um, okay. Will flood mitigation measures for a hundred year old town hall that borders a floodplain be eligible? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that it would, if it's uh, certainly part of the resilience discussion that Representative Sebelia talked about under the $4,000 community grants, um, whether the $500,000 would really be best suited for um, flood mitigation projects. I think we would tend to stick to what's listed in Act 172, which is really, again, focused on building thermal improvements, envelope improvements, fuel switching to advance uh, wood heat. Okay. Um, I want to make sure to our panelists, if there are questions that you're seeing here in the chat that you definitely want to answer, I want to make sure that I am... Uh, I wanted to uh, acknowledge Ann Lawless's uh, question. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, up in the kingdom. Uh, I believe we cited her in our recent commentary about rural capacity, um, or or maybe it wasn't her. Uh, maybe it was someone else. Um, and you, I, we definitely heard the commissioner uh, noting that the administration is aware and contemplating the issue of rural capacity. Uh, so just 
proceed as best as you can um, and know that we are trying to get uh, more help out to you. Great, okay. Um, will local cost share be required or will it help with the scoring of applications? So we have yet to talk about how we are going to uh, score and prioritize projects. The bones of prioritization will be part of what's listed in the bill. Um, and there are several elements in there. In terms of whether or not communities have matching funds, we have chosen not to require a match um, for these grants. So if communities have more money in the bank, that's great. And um, you know, if their project goes over the $500,000 project limit, they are more than welcome to, to augment that funding, but it is not gonna require a match. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question that I wonder could be expanded, maybe leaning on you, Representative Sebelia. Is there an intention in, one, in Act 172 to incorporate an educational aspect into these projects? It'd be great if all of this municipal work could inspire the residential, commercial, and nonprofit sectors to follow suit. Um, yes, 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 yes. And, uh, you know, it, it's the, the $4,000, you know, uh, if it's, you know, monthly pizza party to have folks come together to talk about the planning for their town um, and getting some consensus around that for resilience, um, a mailer, postcards, um, bringing in uh, a, a project manager um, or facilitator to help have convers you know, some, some tough conversations, uh, to pull it together with your neighbor to, you know, bring someone else in. Um, you know, we're, we're saying here uh, that with those $4,000 grants, it's not a lot of money, but it is a lot of money and you can be creative with that. Um, we think folks on the ground know uh, how to start bringing their communities along and um, pointing them in the direction of the needed capacity to get these projects done. One of the, one of the uh, elements that needs to go into municipal energy plans is uh, so-called uh, leading by example. Uh, and this is uh, <laughs> you know, case in point on how municipalities can lead by, an ex by example and show residents and business owners in their communities uh, what can be done. So certainly uh, I think municipalities and regional planning commissions have a, a, a direct interest in, in doing just that work. And, and I think this is a great opportunity for it. Mm -hmm. So indeed, stay in touch with your RPC. Um, so there's a couple of questions again about workforce, um, you know, that it's competing against other, you know, school, HVAC and other energy needs. One particular question, are energy savings companies welcome to bid on this municipal work? And then secondly, has the opportunity for contractors to perform this work been advertised? Do they know about the RFP? Yes, so the RFP for assessments has been advertised. Um, in terms of um, contracting, when we get to the project phase, I don't think we would put any restrictions on um, you know, who's going to be able to, to do the work. If they're capable of performing uh, these projects, I think we're going to need all the capacity we can get in order to accomplish uh, the volume of projects that we hope to get through. Okay. Um, can we use the $4,000 on a grant writer to identify grant opportunities and help write applications? Yeah. Okay. You can. One of the things that we're going to try to work really, really hard on at BGS and in our stakeholder group is, is creating as low of a threshold as possible, which means our grant applications will hopefully be fairly simple. That's the goal. We don't wanna make this hard for people. We wanna make it as easy as possible. So I'm going to try to reduce as much uh, red tape in state government as possible. So yes, you can use it for that, but also hopefully we'll be making these easier uh, to complete as well. Not yet, Jeff, but soon. Um, I guess I just, there's a question about would it be wise for towns to start a revolving energy fund to deposit cost energy saving dollars, you know, from this project or program? Seems like a bigger question potentially about 
how communities can maximize this opportunity. And so I don't know if Representative Sibelia or others want to offer thoughts on that. I'm sorry, say that again, Joey. Maximizing well, just, the opportunity. Well, just that there was a question about would it be wise for a community to, you know, deposit any savings into an revolving, establish sure. a revolving energy fund or otherwise, how do they maximize the benefits of this program? Sure. I mean, I, I think for me, the best way for communities, I mean, it's, it, well, we have all different communities at all different places. So a community starting from zero, the best way to maximize these funds is to get a regular conversation going, maybe set up an energy committee, um, get a plan um, forward. Um, you know, communities communities are uh, pretty smart um, and we're providing them with a lot of technical expertise. So. That's great. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think that's a great idea, Joe. And frankly, if a municipality wants to, you know, basically level out a budget by using the savings to put into a fund to support other energy efficiency measures, um, you know, with the municipality or which are going to benefit the taxpayers by reducing their, their the amount that they're pay, paying to energy and their total cost burden, then that's a great idea. <laughs> I think kudos for whoever thought of that. So um, back to the $4,000 mini grants, because I see some questions in there. So like I said, Laura Sibelia has given us a goal. And so far, we've been trying to exceed her expectations of trying to stand up the $4,000 mini grants by town meeting day, which is in March. So we are, that is once now that we've gotten a couple of other keystone things in motion, we are starting to focus on those $4,000 mini grants right now and getting those grant templates all set up. So that's the goal. And if we can beat it, we will. And if you miss it, it's still a great time to have a conversation. Town meeting, right? Yes. So, cause you know, Absolutely. it's coming, you know, it's coming. So there you go. And with that, I want to say thank you, Representative Sibelia, to you for your leadership, to your colleagues for standing up this program, to all who made it possible, to the um, incredibly hardworking team at BGS, um, Commissioner Fitch, Brian, Tyler, others, um, to the RPC network, um, Jim for pinch hitting today. Here's hoping Peter Gregory feels better. And you know, I think you know this is such an exciting, new, and needed program, and really grateful for it being stood up. There, we got to a lot of questions. We didn't answer all of them. Um, we will aim to do that and follow up with you. So in hopes of getting those questions answered, linking you to the resources, seems like there may be, you know, further opportunities to lean into VLCT and the work that they're doing to analyze how do we maximize the federal funds coming down through the Inflation Reduction Act and other otherwise, I got a lot of details answered. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Um, know that this is the beginning of maximizing this really important opportunity. It's just a piece of the puzzle. So um, we're definitely not gonna be strangers. And I just wanna thank you all again, um, Commissioner Fitch, the BGS team, Representative Sebelia, Jim, and everyone um, will follow up and we're gonna give you back your day with one minute over time. Um, thank you thank all you, so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you.